It's been almost three months since I've cast off from Le Havre. After visiting America, the Pacific Islands and the coasts of the Far East, the Queen Elizabeth has now entered into the Indian Ocean. From the Strait of Malacca to the Gulf of Oman, I'll be crossing the wake of the traders and pirates who over the centuries wrote the chronicle of a route that has become a legend, the Spice Route. A good throw this time. The tow line, a cord weighted with a ball on the end, made it to the pier. The dockers of Port Klang can moor the Queen Elizabeth. The passengers have gone for a day trip to Kuala Lumpur, the capital of Malaysia. I'd rather stay at Port Klang and stroll around, see where my feet take me. We come once in a while. We live outside the city. We live far away. Go ahead, try it. Just to little. Okay, go ahead. Up, up, up. Very good. Talking to the customers of this popular restaurant, I learned that many of them are Malaysian tourists. They're waiting to embark for Pulau Ketam, Crab Island. Thirty minutes later, the speedboat is approaching a fishing village built on stilts above the water. So we, we are in an island, and I saw many crabs in the, in the beach. Yeah, this island, I mean, if back to 20 years ago, is full of crab. That's why this island's name named after the crab, crab island in English. And <clears throat> in Malay, we know it as Pulau Ketam. Pulau is island, Ketam is crab. Actually, back to 20 years ago, uh, this population here is about 30,000 to 50,000. But up to today's, it's only um, more than 10,000, but less than 20,000. Ah. Because the young generation, they don't want to continue here. They don't feel like being fishermen like their father, their grandparents or whatever. And one more thing is the education here. They only have one sec secondary school. So, like, you know, if you wanted to continue college, university, they are nowhere else. So they forced to leave this place. So the young generation go to Kelang or to Kuala Lumpur? Yeah, go to Klang, Kuala Lumpur, uh, as well as other places like Sha'alam, whatever place in the Selangor area, nearby. Ah. Even if the crab goes and disguises himself as Prince Charming, he no longer attracts the youth of Pulau Kitam. 
They don't want a future already mapped out by their parents. They're hoping for a different life. draws to a close and the Queen Elizabeth gets back underway. It's been a long day, but I promised some friends we'd meet at the theatre to take in the show. Since we left Singapore, we've been sailing through the Strait of Malacca, the shortest route from the Pacific Ocean to the Indian Ocean. Arab dahaus, Chinese junks, and Portuguese caravels would sail along these coasts with their holds overflowing with silk, chinaware, pepper, cardamom, and nutmeg. For centuries, the navigators who transited through the Strait of Malacca conveyed ideas, beliefs, and cultures along with them a continuous exchange that has shaped the singular destiny of the little island of Penang. Nutmeg. This, this is nutmeg. This, these are spices. Some books say Street of Harmony. Some books say Peace and Tranquility Street. Okay. So four major religions of the world located on one street. Okay. Muslim. Hindu, Buddhist, and the last one is Christian. Christian. What's your name again? Ali. Ali. Yeah. So Ali, you Muslim? Muslim. He's Christian? No, 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 no. Osman. Osman? I've been there in Malaysia. Oh. English, we call it the goddess of mercy. I never saw that big answer. This cultural and religious mosaic is the fruit of a long history. Li, my guide, has Chinese roots. He tells me how it all started with the seafaring Arab traders. They brought Islam to this region. Later, in the 19th century, Chinese fishermen and Indian farmers settled here, also bringing their beliefs along with their baggage. And I heard that uh, the sleeping Buddha is when uh, he was dying. Is not true? He was in the stage of nirvana. He didn't die. Ah. <laughs> Malaysia is a is a mix between uh, many many culture, many yes, uh, mount, multi ratio. They are in high school, so uh -huh. the medium of instruction is. Malay. So you don't speak Chinese? No. no. <laughs> yeah, lah, there you see, got three colors. Yeah. There, yellow, black, yellow, brown. You champoran maybe? Yes. And there you got champoran. <laughs> right. It's mixed. That's why it's fair. It's fair. If you are fair, yes, an Indian is mixed. Abandoned for a century, the blue mansion of Chung Fatse was painstakingly restored and is now a luxury hotel. Chung Fatse, who arrived here penniless at the age of 16, went on to build an international empire. By the time he died in 1916, he was considered Asia's Rockefeller, 
And yet, at that time, in the early 20th century, the great majority of the Chinese lived in abject poverty. The British made one mistake by passing a law saying that houses built on land must be taxed. So they didn't say anything about the sea. So these early Chinese immigrants were very poor. They came from southern China. So they gather as much wood as possible from the shipping industry and from land, and they build their houses into the sea. So no need to pay tax. We continue along the strait, heading for the Andaman Sea. Three months have now gone by rhythm by the ports with their bustling activity and long, calm days of sailing. Each time the ship leaves a port and heads out to sea, I feel as if I were living in slow motion, outside of time. My life is quite long. I've quite extensive what I've done, but then I um, somehow found myself on working on cruise ships. I started off as a bar waiter and got promoted quite quickly, you know, but my wife was pregnant and you know, I had to, we had to be serious and I had to go home and, but after the, the 10 years when I was at home, I knew in my heart I was going to come back to the sea. Because it's a special place. Yeah, to... of course. It's a bubble. It's a bubble. Mm -hmm. Simone, there's no, there's no life like working on a ship. Well, you know, you've never, we never worked on it. You've never been on a ship for this amount of time, have you? The reality is at home because of my family, and it's it's solid, isn't it? On a ship is, come on. We were in Sydney the other day. We we're in Hong Kong. You know, I know it's real, but sometimes, you know, I don't. Sometimes I have to pinch myself, you know. The Queen has dropped anchor during the night. When I awaken, I behold mysterious islands bathed in the morning sunlight. has cured my homesickness for my French forest near Paris and given my morale a much needed boost. I often need a dose of nature to refresh my mind. But man is a social animal curious about others and the world around him. As we slowly leave the shores of Malaysia, I get back to my investigation of life behind the scenes on the Queen Elizabeth. Oh. 
Now look that way, smile, make sure your flies are done up, and we're going up. <laughs> and here is the uh, Royal Court Theatre. It's amazing. It's not a bad office, is it? Yeah. <laughs> We do all sorts of shows, through from uh, big singing and dancing shows through to uh, Shakespeare uh -huh. and that sort of thing. Whoa. We have lectures in here, we have movies, uh, we do everything. And when we get a new casting or a new show comes on board, we're running 24 hours. Mm -hmm. You know, we'll be doing this from, uh, you know, we do our normal daytime stuff, then as soon as we finish with that, we build the set for the show that's going to be overnight. Uh, they'll come in, they'll be rehearsing overnight through till eight o'clock in the morning then again and the technology that we have here the pit that we just came up on uh, all the, the lighting bars out the front of the house everything is automated uh, it, we really do have the newest technology at the moment it, it's great it, it's for us it, it's wonderful is there any difference to playing in the ship and in the theater okay. the show, um, you know the kind of equipment they have there is superior to anything that you find in the west end Maybe that's a bit of a generalisation, but... No, but, yeah, well, I mean, the theatre is sort of designed... The theatre on the ship is designed like an old sort of Victorian theatre. Um, but the, the ones that you would find in London are so old-fashioned now and the, the lighting isn't great. And, mm -hmm. But here it's, you know, very yeah. high spec and, like, they can do some, so many, like, amazing things with the lighting. And it's back in London or, or wherever, people buy a ticket, so mm -hmm. they actually want to see you perform, whereas sometimes here people... Yeah, the shows here, they, they attract people who wouldn't necessarily go to the theatre. Sometimes it might not be their cup of tea at all. But they'll tell you yeah. if they don't. <laughs> it's, good. It's, it's good, it's good, because Refreshing. we're getting feedback, and actually you need that. And sometimes you don't have enough of that in other jobs. Do you feel uh, being a sello or a traveller? Definitely. Turn around the world. Yeah, well, I do this because I, I love working in the theatre, but I get to travel as well. Very few places I still need to go. Haven't seen South Africa yet. Mm -hmm. That's still one I want to tick off the list. And um, Bermuda as well. Bermuda. That's somewhere. Haven't been there yet, but um, I love the travel, yes. It's, it's one of the main reasons why I went into it in the first place. Uh huh. I've, I've learned so much. I've really enjoyed it. Well, that's going to be a big shock when we, when we, if we go back and work on land mm -hmm. and we have to do eight shows a week, it's going to be like... I'll never forget this. Never. It's been amazing and I think we're really lucky. I feel lucky to have done it. Leaving the Strait of Malacca, we set our course west for Sri Lanka. from the bridge. As I'm sure you will be aware from media reports, over the last few years there has been an increased piracy activity in certain areas of the world. It seems that pirates are not a thing of the past. They've simply adapted to globalization and operate in the regions of the world where political instability allows them a relatively free hand. Um, I mean, pirates have existed in modern days for at least 30, 40 years already. But they've only been in the news more recently because of high-profile incidents involving uh, yachts, private individuals, and the big container ship Maersk, Alabama, uh, two years ago. Uh -huh. Normally they attack ships with a low freeboard, very low to the seawater, where they can easily board with rope ladders, etc. Commando style, they come on board. Then they come on 10 minutes and they're gone in 10 minutes. They know what they want, they know exactly where to go. Uh, but big ships like this is difficult because we're too fast for them and very high for them. And plus we have 3,000 people on board. And then for probably it's only five pirates. A 
mixture of damp heat, incense, burning wood and smoking BDs. All I have to do is to take a deep breath and I know that I've arrived in Sri Lanka. I happily plunge into the colourful bustle of Colombo streets to meet Gishan. Gishan works with an NGO for volunteers here to help the communities hit by the tsunami of December 2004. So this, this uh, house without roof is damaged from... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now there is special uh, care, uh, I mean special uh, organization in case of there is another earthquake. Yeah, as a precaution, uh, precaution. now we have a tsunami uh, warning system implemented. Because the, the real danger is if something happens at the night. A new district of the village has been built at a distance from the shore. A peaceful neighborhood with no trace of the tragedy that each family experienced. Now it's the children that carry the hope and give them the force to go on living. Uh, this building was done by Project Subroad volunteers. They financially helped us, and uh, two, actually two Dutch uh, volunteers. So the beauty of this uh, kind of project is that the person who is coming here doesn't need to have any experience related to teaching. But if they have experience, we have more projects, so we can match their exact uh, skills, talents, and uh, get a good match between what they are doing and what they are coming here for. So you came from Germany to uh, spend your holidays here? And be no, here? it's not my holiday. I've been here for three months. I just wanted to immerse myself in the culture, so I came here to help, to help the women. The fact is, I've constructed something here with the women, the mothers and daughters, and all the others. It's been a fantastic experience. The interesting thing is that I'm not just here to help out, but to try to construct something collectively with the women. This is the bathroom? Yes, it's the bathroom. At first there was only a wall. Sometimes it's hard to leave your newfound friends and get back to the plush comfort of the ship. But this feeling is a luxury of the Voyager. I chase the blues away by doing a few sketches in my logbook, a safeguard against forgetfulness. Thank you for calling. Have a nice evening, Alice.
March the 31st. We arrive in Cochin, India, and as we slowly make our way up the channel, cluttered with freighters, we see the city's history pass before our eyes. The governor's palace harks back to the Portuguese, then Dutch, domination. The large fishing nets recall the fleet of Chinese junks commanded by Theng He, who called in here early in the 15th century. I like the atmosphere of this cosmopolitan city where the Jewish, Christian and Muslim communities used to live in harmony. I've been to Cochin often and I never tire of seeing the fishermen haul up these nets from a bygone age. This is a Chinese fishing net. Uh -huh. This is, a, uh, it was introduced by the Chinese between the 13th and 14th century. Ah. But this is fish but, for, for market or? Yeah, yeah. Normally they sell in the other side. In the modern uh, city, uh -huh. there is a big market. The morning and the evening there is a market and then they sell all there. And then normally it will take, uh, they, they kept under the water in five to ten minutes and then re... Uh, pull. pull. Yeah, they re pull. Normally five to six people work together for do this purpose. But Cochin's history is above all linked to the spice trade and the Portuguese colonization, which began in 1497 with the arrival of Vasco da Gama. And I but heard that he died here? He died here, yes. He died here in uh, 1524, during the, uh, during the Christmas evening. Mm -hmm. He died over here, and then he uh, buried over here also. Ah. But later, 14 years after, his son, he came here, and then uh, the rest of the body, they uh, uh, took back to uh, Lisbon. To Lisbon? Lisbon, yeah. Yeah, he buried over here. here there is more, it's marked his de detail also, you can see. Yeah. In, he got a malaria. Malaria? Malaria on the, on the route. He visited three times in India. First in, uh, in the 1498 to found the sea route. And then 1502, who came here, who discussed about the spices uh, to the commercial purpose. The spices? Okay. Yeah, spices first. The Malabar coast is still a major producer of pepper, but the spice trade is no longer what it used to be. The memory of that commercial and human adventure still lingers in the district of Jew Street, where all the spice warehouses used to be. All, all kind of spices available here. From Kerala? Yes, only from Kerala. Especially in the north part of Kerala. Uh, dry, dry ginger. Dry ginger. Dry ginger. This is star anise. Star anise, anise et toile. Yes, anise et toile. Kumar. Kumar, oui. C'est Kumar, c'est anise là. Kumar. And this tea also is from India? Yes. Yes? Of course. Not from Sri Lanka? No. No? <laughs> here, uh, plenty of tea here. Why we are uh, importing? Uh, exactly. Plenty. Like kadi. Indian kadi. The age when spices from Kerala were worth more than gold is long gone. In spite of those heady boom times, we shouldn't forget that the principal riches of the region has always been coconuts. Even the name is a reminder, for Kerala means land of the coconut in Malayalam. These trees give the landscape an idyllic languor and provide the inhabitants with a miracle fruit. Yeah, that's a man. 
April 1st, I spend a good part of the day playing ring toss on the deck. Fun, but hardly enough to fill a page of my logbook. Luckily, around 6 p.m., I go down to the kitchen to see James, the executive chef. got my style from everybody a little bit, which I think is right from everybody, because we work on the ship. There is, uh, you know, there is no land contact or the people are away from family. There are many other things. So what we normally do is we utilize the best out of uh, each individual. Mm -hmm. So we should know the individual more uh, and work our things according to them rather than make them all work for, you know, we should work as a team basically. So only, only challenge when you come on the second or third, second part or second half of the world voyage, the guests are a bit uh, tired with the menus and repetitions or, you know, there is a limit which we can uh, continue with the food. So it makes it more crispy, you see. Make sure that every time you put mm -hmm. So we got to include a little bit more of the simple kind of food into the menu. I'm sure you have a very good knowledge about meal everywhere in the world mostly. Do you have any favorite one? Uh, favorite one is I think uh, my mother's cuisine. Yeah, <laughs> good answer. <laughs> like dal? Or dal, dal or uh, you know like uh, biryani. It's, it's not only the taste actually, it is the whole atmosphere maybe, I'm not mm -hmm. sure about. But uh, my mother is a very good cook. Basically I, I started to enjoy cooking because of her. I had options to go to Australia this and that but for me I think I'm quite okay back home. I don't want to, you know, that's where I belong, so I'd better go back there. That's what I was thinking. That's where I belong. I love yeah. this idea. Yeah. Close to 20 million inhabitants and economic capital of India, Bombay still has unresolved issues with British colonization. In 1996, the city became Mumbai from the name of the goddess Mumba, venerated by the early inhabitants. The name has changed, but there are still double-decker buses circulating in the avenues that are lined with Victorian buildings. A carefully dozed mixture of modernity and tradition that has predominated since the 19th century, attracting a constant influx of people fascinated by the mirage of the city. So, Bombay has been made on two money. The one money is the cotton and the other money is opium. That's why, that's why it is called Opium City. Ah. So they sold opium to China uh -huh. and all the people who, the great, great rich guys made a big money and that's why you find a lot of charity and uh, social work was done in Bombay because they felt guilty about the money what they made from opium. Oh, 
Uh, how can you explain that uh, Bombay is so attractive uh, economically? Uh, many people come. See, when the India got independence, there were certain cities where it developed, like uh, Madras, Calcutta, Bombay. Bombay is only one place, or rather we call Mumbai now. It's the only place which has everything, which has uh, is the most cosmopolitan city. Once uh -huh. the, it has a harbor, it has a glamour world, Bol Hollywood or Bollywood, whatever you call it, and then. Um, it's the possibility of getting jobs. There are factories and mills and so many. So it has always been an uh, immigrant town. Everything is possible in Bombay. Yeah, everything is possible. Everything. The station started from here up to Thana in 1853. 1870, I think this station came a little, little later on, this big station. But that way, the trains is the connection of India, I mean to say. If there is somebody who has united India, is is the train. Oh. The trains have, and the railways have united India. Others, India is a very dispersed. All, each state looks different, eats different, talks different but the railway has connected them. Ah, it's very interesting. Guided by the clamor of the crowd and the aroma of curry, I pursue my stroll through the maze of lower class neighborhoods. This city would like to be a modern metropolis and yet it marginalizes the immigrants from the rural areas. The blight of Bombay's shanty towns just keeps spreading. Before the inexorable progression of this phenomenon, the glitter of Bollywood embodies new hopes and dreams. Musical comedy as a way of forgetting the harshness of the human condition. Making her way through a swarm of freighters and fishing boats, the Queen Elizabeth heads for the open sea towards the Gulf of Oman. Bombay recedes in the light of the setting sun. Emerging from the night like a ghost ship, the Queen Elizabeth docks in Dubai. A strange rendezvous. The floating city meets the city striving for the heavens. Sailing through the creek, the 10-kilometer arm of the sea that separates the city in two, we discover the atmosphere of the Middle Eastern cities. The Dahaus, fat-bellied cargo boats laden with goods, cross dozens of abras, wooden taxi boats, bobbing like tiny water bugs. Dubai. They say that Dubai means the two brothers, two brothers that were separated by the creek, an arm of the sea. Du means two, and bai means brother. 
So Dubai existed, in fact, before these skyscrapers. It was a port on the spice route. The spices transited through here. Right. The arm of the sea facilitated the commercial traffic. There's a reference to the Gulf of Dubai carved into the columns of the Temple of Karnak in Egypt. Because you mustn't forget that where we are here was a vital link between Asia and Europe. After we leave the shaded lanes of the souk, I go to take a look at the new city. This is no mirage. Dubai is a very real city. In less than 20 years, hundreds of buildings have sprung up from the desert sands to thrust skyward like so many 21st century towers of Babel bent on conquering the heavens. From the top of Burj Khalifa, the highest building in the world, 828 meters tall, the city looks like a gigantic Lego construction. If we go back 50 years ago, you know, uh, we'd say, or 60 years ago, people here lived in a very difficult conditions. So uh, in the late 60s, to be exact, 60, 1968, oil was discovered. So I think the government utilized Dubai never been rich with oil. So in the mid 80s, uh, the government of Dubai decided to diversify resources, mm -hmm. you know, so not dependent on oil because oil is very limited. So they concentrated on tourism. This ambitious project would never have seen the light of day without the manpower of immigrants from all corners of the Muslim world. They now make up 85% of the Emirates' total population. As we leave Dubai, the Queen Elizabeth salutes her predecessor in the fleet. This is where the Queen Elizabeth II retired to be transformed into a luxury casino hotel. April the 6th. During the night, we crossed the Strait of Hormuz. In the morning, we're coming into Muscat, the capital of the Sultanate of Oman. I meet my guide in the old district of Mutra, Muscat's port. His name alone, Sultan, is an invitation to discover the history of this land of the thousand and one nights. Ah, salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. 
How are you? Great. Doing well? Sure, it's fine. Welcome to Oman. Thank you. And especially to Muscat. We're heading for the souk. Ready for the souk? Ready and willing. Do you have any cash? Any Omani reals? I don't have any reals. I'll help you out, no problem. Okay. So the locals still come to this souk? That's right. Today is Friday. There are always more people here on Fridays. Many of them come in the afternoon and stay till late, because after the siesta, our national sport, the souk stays open very late in the evening. Okay. This must be Mir here? No, that's not Mir, it's frankincense. Frankincense is the resin that we gather from the frankincense tree that grows in the south. In ancient times, Oman grew prosperous thanks to frankincense because the frankincense trade was really huge. We exported frankincense to Mesopotamia, to Egypt, because the Egyptians also used it in their ceremonies, to Rome and the church. Now, why did the church use it? Because it was a gift of one of the three wise men. One of the three wise men offered the baby Jesus frankincense. During that time, frankincense was worth its weight in gold. Now, a few meters on, we'll venture into a spot where I never brought my wife, that's for sure. No kidding. It's the gold souk. Okay. Here we are. Our women are very fond of gold. So, now there you see the lady entering first, and the man follows, but he's kind of dragging his heels, right? Those women you see there come from the south, where there's an African influence. They came from Zanzibar. You know the story about how that came about. And there are many still arriving in the south, but they come up here to sell frankincense. Right next to the gate of the souk, you have the city gate. It was quite well protected by the watchtower you see up there, and you can see that the cannons are still there. Since we've been in the Indian Ocean, not a single day has gone by without crossing the routes of those intrepid Arab navigators. With the exception of Ahmed ibn Majid, the Omani pilot of Vasco da Gama, the names of all those brave seafarers have scattered to the four winds of history. All except Sinbad, the hero of the tales of the Thousand and One Nights. So this is the famous Dahao? Right, this is the famous Dao, the famous Sohar. Sohar is a port city to the north. And we Omanis believe that Sohar was the birthplace of Sinbad the sailor. Okay. Many of the great Arab navigators were from this country. Omanis. Yes, yeah, so this Dao as a monument in the middle of the city is here as a constant reminder of our history and what our ancestors have accomplished. If you would. In the tales of A Thousand and One Nights, the character of Sinbad the Sailor is, is a bit like the characters of Homer. Apparently, the author took a variety of heroic tales about different seafarers and embodied them in one character. And if you look closely at the story of Sinbad the Sailor, you see that the action always comes back to Oman. As I told you, the only Arab sailing the seas at the time were the Omanis. The Arab masters of the sea were Omanis. Omanis even up to the present day. Now, what you see over there is the old Portuguese cemetery. Of course, they brought them in by the sea, and then they buried them there. And right up there, you can see two watchtowers. On the other side is the old city of Muscat. The positive thing is that our country is, of course, developing but we still preserve our traditions. Right. 
I'll remember today as one of the loveliest of the entire voyage. With the souks and their heady aroma of incense, the faces that reflect all the shores of the Indian Ocean, Muscat is the Orient tugging at the sleeve of my imagination. It's the alluring voice of Scheherazade inviting me to continue the voyage. After America, Oceania and Asia, I now set my course for the Mediterranean, the cradle of so many civilizations. <laughs> <laughs> 